from our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. Now tonight, I want you to turn with me to 1 Kings, the 18th chapter. 1 Kings, the 18th chapter in the Old Testament. 1 Kings 18. And this is one of the most dramatic stories in all the Bible. 1821. How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal be God, follow him. And the people answered, not a word. Elijah is the most remarkable character to me in all the Old Testament. I like to read about him. He's mentioned 30 times in the New Testament, and when Jesus Christ went to the Mount of Transfiguration, there were two men that were there with him, Elijah and Moses. So we know that hundreds of years after Elijah had died or had been taken to heaven, we know that he came back. And we know that he was living and he was talking because he was on the Mount of Transfiguration. But here in his life story, he suddenly appears at the darkest moment of Israel's history. Never had the nation gone so low morally, spiritually, militarily, economically, as it was at this hour. The nation was struggling for its very existence and out of nowhere, there came this rugged, strong, craggy, young, long-haired, sun-tanned son of the desert, Elijah. And he suddenly announced to the people, Elijah is here. And the king trembled on his throne because Elijah came in the power and the anointing of the Spirit of God. It used to be said that Mary, Queen of Scots, was more afraid of the prayers of John Knox, one preacher, than she was all the armies of England. One man and God constitute a majority anywhere. Elijah was a mighty prophet of the Lord. And what had happened in Israel that had caused Israel to go down so rapidly was that a very wicked man had come to the throne. His name was Ahab. And the Bible says that he did more evil than any other king that had ever preceded him. And then he did something else. He married a woman from one of the heathen nations, which was against ancient Israeli law. He married Jezebel, and she worshipped Baal. She didn't believe in God. She didn't believe in the God of ancient Israel. She didn't believe in the God of Moses. She didn't believe in the God of Abraham. She believed in Baal. And Baal was one of the worst forms of worship that we've ever known. Filled with sensuality, sex orgies, human sacrifice, and all the rest. And this is a very interesting thing, that in a time when people turn away from the true God, many times you'll find that they will put sex, violence, and their religion together. And we're seeing indications of that in America with the rise of Satan worship and their cults, the emphasis on sex, the emphasis on violence. Put them together and you have something the Bible says that God abhors and God will judge and the wrath of God will fall upon that people. And that was the situation when Elijah appeared on the scene. And the first thing Elijah did was to protest, except Elijah was almost alone. He thought he was alone. But God had told him later that there were 7,000 that hadn't bowed the knee to Baal. And Elijah said to the king, all right, here's what I want you to do. I want you to gather all the prophets of Baal that believe in idolatry and lead idolatry in this country. I want you to gather them at Mount Carmel that looks out over the Mediterranean Sea. And I'll come up there and we'll let all the people come and watch and we'll have a contest. I will debate 
the 450 prophets of Baal publicly and let the people decide who is God. And the king said, all right. So all the people gathered, thousands of people gathered on Mount Carmel and the 400 prophets of Baal. And Elijah was standing for God alone. He was just one man, one solitary prophet standing there all by himself. He said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to get two bulls, build two altars. You call on your God, Baal. I'll call on my God, the true and the living God, and we'll see who answers by fire. They said, all right. So they built their altar. They cut their bull, bullock up, laid it on the altar, thousands of people watching, and then they began to call on Baal. They said, oh, Baal, 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 answer by fire. We know you're the true God. Nothing happened. And Elijah stood there and laughed at it. And it's one of the most humorous things in all the Bible. He said, go ahead, yell. Maybe your God's on a trip somewhere. And from morning till noon, they screamed and they yelled and they cried and they prayed and then they began to cut themselves until blood was gushing out all over the place, trying to get Baal to answer. But of course, Baal couldn't answer. And then Elijah said, all right, it's time for me to take over. He said, all right, build the altar. And they built the altar put the bullock on the altar. He said, now I want you to get 12 barrels of water and pour it on top. Dig a trench around it, fill that with water, and everything is soaking wet. Then Elijah called upon God, and the fire came down from heaven and burned up the bullock and burned up the altar, burned up the whole thing. And the people said, we believe in the Lord God who is answered by fire. And Elijah won the day and left Mount Carmel victorious over the false prophets of Baal. I want you to notice who was there. Three groups of people. One group, one man, Elijah. On the other side, 450 prophets of Baal, all experts in religion, philosophy, and psychology. And, on the, and out in between were the vast mass of people who were not sure. They were uncommitted. They were not sure whether Baal was God. They were not sure whether Elijah's God was God. Their ancient, ancient traditions made them want to believe in Jehovah. Their interest, though, was in pleasing the king and being relevant and being in. They didn't want to be old-fashioned and traditionalist and out of step. They didn't want to be caught believing in the Ten Commandments if that wasn't the end thing. You see, men have always been sort of faddist. We go after fads. That's true in every generation. And the end thing at that moment was to believe in Baal with all the freedom of sex and sensuality and the orgies. Now, they didn't like the human sacrifice, but all religion demands some sort of sacrifice, so what they would do, they'd take their babies, many times a chosen baby, and put in the hands of this great God, and the baby would be burned up, and they'd give their babies as human sacrifices. That was Baal worship. But then there were many who were secret followers of the true God. They didn't believe all that hocus-pocus about Baal. They had a guilty feeling about it, but they were afraid. They were afraid of standing up for God, afraid of standing up for what they believed to be truth. And so they didn't take a stand publicly. You see, Jesus demands a public stand. That's why I ask people to come forward. He demands a public stand. You can't be a secret follower of Jesus and please him. 
He said, if you're not willing to take your stand publicly and openly, I'll not take my stand openly for you in heaven. And without the intercession of Jesus Christ, none of us would ever make it. And then Elijah said something to all these people. If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. He said, make a decision. God's not going to allow you to have an altar to Baal in your home, to materialism in your home, and then go to church on Sunday and think that's going to do it. You've got to come all out for Jesus Christ. He must be first and Lord in every area of your life if you're to be acceptable to God. Now, the people had seen the evidence. They knew Baal couldn't give them peace and joy and happiness. They knew that. You know, one of our most famous film stars said the other day this. I won't call her name, but she was quoted in one of the magazines as saying this. I was the victim of the American dream. I'd been brought up to believe that when I found success, I would automatically be terribly happy. We were all taught that. Well, I got the success. I'd spent 21 years believing that as soon as all these wonderful things happened to me, my troubles would vanish. Well, they didn't. It, it was a big disillusionment, she said, and she's only 21 now. 21 years thinking that if she made it on television, and she's famous on television, and she's famous in motion pictures around the world, that she'd be happy. She said, it's been a big disillusion. You see, Baal can't bring inner peace and satisfaction to the human heart. Pascal once said it, the great scientist. He said, happiness is neither within or without us. It is in God. And only when God is in us is happiness within us and without us. How true that is. Happiness and peace and joy come in knowing God. Baal couldn't answer their deepest needs, their great philosophical questions of where did I come from, why am I here, where am I going. Baal gave them no answers. Neither does capitalism and materialism and secularism and humanism. It's found only in a relationship with God. You see, you were made for God made in God's image, made for fellowship with God. And you can try all your life in a thousand different directions to find that certain something and you'll never find it. I've seen men strive to become the most brilliant scientist and I know some of the most brilliant scientists in America that are miserable. I've seen men spend their lifetime making money and I know some of the richest men in America and I know how miserable some of them are. I've seen men strive all their lives to attain political power. And they get political power. They get the office they were seeking, but it doesn't bring the peace and the joy and the happiness and the fulfillment they thought it would. But here's an interesting thing. I've never seen a person give their lives to Jesus Christ sincerely, but what they didn't find, what they were looking for. He satisfies the deepest longings of our hearts and our lives. Now, Elijah taught us one thing, and Jesus teaches it too. You must make a choice. You have a will of your own, and you have to decide. How long will you halt between two opinions? Jesus said there are two ways of life. Now, the Bible says there's a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Some of you think you're all right and that you're on the right road now. You don't realize that you're on the broad road that leads to destruction. Jesus said there are two roads, the broad road and the narrow road. The narrow road leads to eternal life. The broad road leads to destruction. And every person in this audience tonight is on one or the other. Which are you on? He said there are two masters. He said you cannot serve God and mammon. You'll either hate one and love the other or love one and hate the other. He said make a choice. He said there are two fathers. You know, the Bible doesn't teach the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man, not in the sense that many people teach it. By creation, he's our father. By creation, we're all members of the same human race, 
And that's why we're to love each other no matter what race we come from. We're all brothers in that sense. But spiritually speaking, spiritually speaking, we are not all of the same father and all of the same blood. There are only two groups, those who are lost and those who are saved, those on the broad road, those on the narrow road. You must be on one or the other. And there are two destinies. There is a heaven and there is a hell. I know it's not popular today to believe in hell. You can believe in heaven, but people would rather not think about hell. I don't blame you. It's a terrible place. But the Bible teaches it's going to be a hell. There is a hell where men are going to be separated from God forever. And there's a heaven where men are going to fellowship with each other and fellowship with Christ forever. You must make a choice. You young people, you have to make the choice. This is one choice you can't depend on your parents to make for you. Your parents can teach you and help you and do their best. And many of you parents have done your best with your children. You've prayed for them, you've loved them. But there comes a time when they have to make their own choice about Jesus Christ. They have to decide for themselves in the lonely arena of their own hearts. The greatest battle that's ever fought is this battle in the heart of a young person about Jesus Christ. And this is one thing you can't depend on anybody to make for you. You have the ability to make it. You have the right to make it. You can say yes or you can say no. It's one or the other. And Jesus does not allow neutral ground. And he warns against waiting too long. The Bible says now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. He that hardeneth his heart, being often reproved, shall suddenly be cut off, and that without remedy. Come while you can. Don't put it off any longer. How long halt you between two opinions? Now, when you make that choice, there's going to be a price to be paid. The people that choose Jesus Christ will pay a price. There are thousands of people in other parts of the world, the price they have to pay is they're ostracized from their family. In some parts of the world, they can never go any further than grammar school if they make a decision for Christ. They can never get a job above menial labor if they make a decision for Christ. But in those parts of the world, thousands upon thousands are living for Jesus Christ. In America, we've had sort of an unnatural situation. It's almost popular to follow Christ in some areas of the country now. That won't last long. There's always a price. And if you receive Christ as your Savior and try to live for him, some people are going to sneer and they're going to make fun behind your back. And in this period of conformity, we don't want to be considered too different, but he calls upon you to be different. When the gang is doing certain things you know to be wrong, you take your stand and say, no, I can't do that because I'm a Christian, because I believe in Jesus Christ. It costs something to follow Christ. And Jesus said, you better sit down and count the cost one day. You see, a big crowd was following Jesus, and he said, wait a minute, count the cost. Do you know that I'm going to die on a cross, and if you follow me, you're going to have to go die with me? Oh, we didn't know that, Jesus. We thought you were setting up a big kingdom. We were going to be in the kingdom with you. So they left him. They will, there will be the cross for you to bear before the crown. And when you do come to Jesus Christ, you're going to be tested by God. God never has anyone come to him that he doesn't test you. Some of you have made your decisions for Christ this week, and already you're being tested. Temptation is coming. A friend doesn't understand the step that you've taken. Already you are filled with some doubts and weakness. This is all normal to every person that ever came to Christ. We don't start, just jump right out and be full grown. 
Grady Wilson, just, his daughter just had twins. Well, they weren't born full grown. One of them was five pounds and one was six pounds, and they're just little tiny babies. But they will be full grown someday. But it takes time to grow. God will test you when you come to Christ. And he demands an immediate decision. I wonder how many more sermons it would take to win you to Christ. How many more warnings will God have to give you? How, how many more graves will have to be dug? How many more wars will have to be fought? How many more earthquakes or tornadoes and floods will have to come before you make your decision? The thief on the cross took that one moment and said, Lord, remember me. And in that moment, Jesus said, Thou shalt be with me in paradise. That quick, you can make your decision and commitment. And remember, God loves you. He has a plan for your life. You're sinful. You're separated from God by sin. And some of the results of this sin are worry and irritability and lack of purpose in life, as well as some of the gross, immoral sins that we read about. God has provided the cross as a means for you to be forgiven of sin, but you must individually receive Christ as your Lord and your Savior. You and you alone in the quiet arena of your heart will have to make that decision. How long? will you halt between two opinions. Charlotte Elliott was a beautiful woman and a great preacher by the name of Caesar Milan went all over Switzerland. He was put out of his church because of his faith. But once he was in England and he met this beautiful, charming young woman by the name of Charlotte Elliott. She was suffering ill health and he went up to her and asked her if she would become a Christian. And she rebuked him and said, I resent you asking me that. And she was very irritated at him. He said, I didn't mean to be offensive to you, but I only meant to tell you that God loves you and God's willing to change your life and give you peace in your heart. That night, Charlotte Elliott could not sleep. The words that the preacher spoke to her kept ringing in her ears. And during the night, she got up, got on her knees, gave her life to Christ, and she sat down and wrote the hymn that we sing every night. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. Just as you are. You don't have to go home and change clothes. You don't have to go home and get better. You can't improve yourself. You come just like you are with all your sins, with all your failures, with all your mistakes, with all your hypocrisy. You come just as you are. He will forgive you and change you and come into your life. And I'm going to ask you to do just that publicly and openly right now. I'm going to ask hundreds of you to get up out of your seat from all over this stadium and come and stand in front of this platform and say by coming, I do receive Christ. You may be a member of the church, you might have thought that you were right with God before, but somehow you know you're not. You're not sure. You're not certain, but you'd like to be. I'm going to ask you to come right now. From up in the top galleries, it'll take a minute or two to come, but we're going to wait. Hundreds of people have come every night. You come. This is your moment and your hour of commitment. And after you've all come and stand here quietly, I'm going to say a word to you, have a prayer with you, give you some literature and you can go back and join your friends and if you're with friends or relatives or you've come in a bus they'll wait on you but you get up and come right now and make your commitment to christ we're going to wait As hundreds are responding to Mr. Graham's invitation to make a public commitment to Jesus Christ, you can make that same commitment right where you are. Just pick up the phone and call the number you see on your screen. Special friends are waiting to talk with you and pray with you about this most important decision.
to you that are watching by television, you can make your commitment right now in your home or wherever you happen to be watching. Hundreds of people here at the University of Kentucky Coliseum are coming to Jesus Christ. They're choosing between these two opinions. They're choosing Christ. They're coming just as they are. You can come just as you are where you are. May God help you to make that commitment tonight. God bless you. If you just prayed that prayer with my father or if you have any questions about a relationship with Jesus Christ, I would just call that number that is on the screen. There'll be someone there to talk with you, pray with you, and answer those questions. And remember, God loves you. If you would like to commit your life to Jesus Christ, please call us right now toll free at 1-877-772-4559. That's 1-877-772-4559. Or you can write to us at Billy Graham, 1 Billy Graham Parkway, Department C, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28201. Or you can contact us on the web 24-7 at peacewithgod.tv. We'll get the same helps to you that we give to everyone who responds at the invitation. On behalf of Franklin Graham and the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, thank you for watching and thank you for your prayers. From our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. To you that are watching by television, this great stadium here at uh, San Jose University in the southern area of San Francisco Bay in San Jose is filled to overflowing. There are a few empty seats here and there, but if you took the people on the ground that are sitting all over the ground, it more than fill uh, this uh, great stadium where the Spartans play. Tonight, I want you to turn with me to the Old Testament, to Joshua, the 24th chapter. To Joshua, the 24th chapter. Now, you that are watching on television are going to see a telephone number across the screen. You call anytime during this program or after the program, and their counsel is standing by to talk with you about your spiritual problems and your spiritual needs. And so pick up the phone and call. If you call and it's busy, call again. Now the 24th chapter of Joshua. Joshua, as you know, was a great military leader. And he took the place of Moses when Moses went to be with the Lord. And the 15th verse. Now he had called all the leaders of Israel together at a place called Shechem. And he's getting ready to die. And this is his farewell address. And during this address, he warns the people about their idolatry. He warns them that the judgments of God will fall upon them unless they live for the Lord. And here's what he says. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve. If you want to serve the devil, serve him. But make a choice. Whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but then he says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Joshua said, if every one of you serves other idols and other gods, makes no difference. As for me and my house, we've already made a decision. We are going to serve the Lord. And that's a decision that every single person here tonight has to make. You either have to decide that you're going to serve the gods of materialism all around us or the true and the living God. And Joshua was warning the people 
to choose God, to follow Him instead of these other gods. And so we have to make a choice. Moses had warned Israel much earlier, a generation earlier, when he was dying. He said, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I've set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore choose life that both thou and thy seed may live. Moses had said the same thing that Joshua is saying, separated by many years, and every generation has to hear it over and over and over again. And that's why the gospel never grows old. It applies to every generation alike. We have to make a choice. Alexander the Great was asked how he conquered the world. He said, by not wavering. And James says in the first chapter, he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. He said, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Are you unstable about your relationship to Christ? Do you waver in your relationship to Christ? Or are you totally committed to Christ as Savior and Lord? Or do you waver about it? Many of you waver by the way you live. And Jesus warned the hypocrites, people who pretend one thing and live another. This was his great battle with the hypocrites in the church. We have old proverbs that are familiar to us all. He who hesitates is lost. Procrastination is the thief of time. A stitch in time saves nine. A bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. Don't waver. Make a decision. Do it now. That's what Joshua was saying. And Joshua, the great military hero that had led them from victory to victory, reminded them of all the victories that God had given. And he said, serve God and live. Serve these other gods and you'll die and come under the judgment of God. And the message has not changed. Now the wars were over. But Joshua found that the people were going toward idolatry. And many times the problems of peace are greater than the problems of war. And he had called all these leaders to Shechem. Now Shechem was a place, the most historical place in all of Israel at that time and still is today. It was where Abraham had first settled when he left Ur of the Chaldees. It was where Jacob had purchased his parcel of land. It was where the bones of Joseph had been buried when they were brought up from Egypt. And so he has, there are two mountains there. I've stood there. And on one mountain he put six of the tribes and on the other mountain he put the other six and Joshua spoke with a mighty voice even though he was an old man. And he reviews the history of Israel and how God had blessed them and how they had won their victories not by their own power and their own strategies and their own ingenuity and their own strength but by the power of God. And the people should have been grateful to God, but instead they were now going to other gods. And we in America should be grateful to God for the blessings He's given us. But what do we find? We find that we're worshiping other gods, the gods of pleasure, the gods of lust and greed and hate, the gods of materialism, even the gods of war. And Joshua tells them that such a condition cannot continue. They must decide whether they want to serve the idols or to serve the living God. And he will not allow any neutrality. Neither does Jesus Christ. And Joshua said, you have to decide immediately now. Choose you this day, not tomorrow, this day, whom you're going to serve. And many of you are going to have to decide tonight. What is the number one priority in your life? Is the priority Christ or is the priority something else? Christ demands first place. There's no room on the throne of your heart for two gods. It's either Christ or it's the other God. Because I believe the emphasis must, we must lay it out straight that you cannot serve God and mammon. You must make a choice. And I found that the harder the challenge is, the greater the response. Young people today want a challenge. They want something tough and hard, all right? Give your life to Christ. 
He'll challenge you because he says you must deny self and take up a cross. He says, I'm going to a place of execution. Come and go with me. Deny your own selfish ambitions and lust and turn to me and go to the cross with me. Now, Paul taught that a Christian is someone who has turned to God from idols to serve the living and the true God. There's a film showing throughout the world this year called The Idol Maker, but a Christian is an idol breaker. And regardless of their decision, Joshua said, it's for me and my house, we are going to serve the Lord. You know, Adam and Eve had to make a choice in the Garden of Eden. God said, if you want to build a wonderful world, we'll build it together. But I'm going to test you because I've given to you the ability to choose. I haven't made you a robot in which I could punch a button and you would obey me. I've made you in my image. You have the right to choose. So when Adam and Eve faced that choice, they chose wrongly. They broke the law of God. And God said, in the day that you do, you will suffer and die. And man has been suffering ever since. And it's all because of that first sin in the Garden of Eden. And man has been inheriting that tendency to sin ever since. The seed of sin is in us when we're born. David said, in sin did my mother conceive me. Think of it now. At conception, sin was already planted. And then comes the age of accountability, moral accountability, maybe eight or nine or ten years of age, when you are held accountable by God for your actions and you choose to sin. And then the rest of your life you practice sin. You're born toward sin. You choose to sin at a certain point, And then you practice sin. And the Bible says we have all sinned. And we're all idolaters. Now Adam had to make a choice and he made the wrong choice. You have to make a choice. Many of you that are watching by television, I hope that you'll use that telephone number right now and call in and make the choice for Christ and say to that counselor, as for me in my house, I choose the Lord. And then many choices, like the rich young ruler. Remember he came to Jesus and he was filled with questions and he wanted eternal life and he said, Sir, what must I do to find eternal life? And Jesus said, looked at him and loved him and said, Go sell all that you have. Give it to the poor. Take up the cross. Follow me. The young man was grieved. He wept. He wanted Christ. But he wanted his money more. Now, if he had said, all right, I'll do it, Lord, I'm sure the Lord would have said, no, it's not your money I want. I want your heart. It's our attitude toward these idols and toward the, these things. The television itself can become an idol. When we walk into the room, all conversation stops and we sort of sit there in reverence watching that box to see if J.R. is going to be shot again. Now, the Bible says we must choose two ways of life. Jeremiah had written, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I set before you the way of life and the way of death. There's a way of life, there's a way of death. Which way are you on? Jesus said, I am the way. I am the way. I'm the only way. I'm the only way to permanent peace. I'm the only way to permanent joy. I'm the only way to eternal life. I'm the only way to forgiveness of sin. I'm the only way to the Father. You have to come by me. And that eliminates a lot of people. When Jesus began to talk about dying on the cross, a lot of his followers left him. They said, Lord, we thought you were going to sit up on a big throne and we were going to drive in Cadillacs and we were going to have beautiful swimming pools and lovely ladies and all the rest of it. We didn't really know that you were going to die and wanted us to go with you. We thought this was going to be a kingdom and we were going to overthrow Rome and we were going to rule the world. And that is going to happen someday. 
But not now, the cross before the crown. Some of us want the crown before the cross. The Bible says there is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. What are some of the ways? Well, some people say, I'm going to follow my conscience, but you don't follow your conscience. Many of us have dead consciences. Your conscience is no longer a safe guide. You've hardened it, you've deadened it. And then other people say, well, I try to be sincere in everything I do. We're, we're here on a football stadium right here. And many years ago, I saw a man pick up a football and he ran 65 yards the wrong way. Now, he was one of the most sincere fellows you ever saw. <laughs> Lost the game. And then there are many people that say, well, you know, I do a lot of good works and I give money to charitable causes and I, I do all that. I, I'm sure God will understand. The Bible says, for by grace are ye saved, through faith, not, not that not of yourselves, but the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. See, if you could work your way to heaven and pay your way to heaven, you'd get up and say, look what I did. I got myself here by my own good works. The only way you're ever going to make it is to come to that cross where Christ took our sins and our judgment and our hell and identify ourselves with him. And then there are some people that say, well, I'll reform, I, I'll do better. I know people that are always saying, I'm going to do better. But they never do better. They don't have any power within them to do better until they come to Christ. And when you come to Christ, an explosion takes place of power that he gives you to live a new life. I can't live the Christian life. I have no power within me to live the Christian life. The Holy Spirit has to live in me and Christ has to live through me. I cannot live the Christian life. I'm a total flop and failure. Jesus said, enter ye in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leadeth unto life and few there be that find it. Few, he said, only a few are going to find that narrow gate and that narrow way, as I said last evening. Are you among that few? You not only choose between two ways of life, but you choose between two masters. Jesus said, no man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and materialism, he says in Matthew the sixth chapter in the Sermon on the Mount. You have to make a choice. All the way through the Bible, choices, 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 choices. Not only between two ways of life and two masters, but you're going to have to choose between two fathers, two spiritual fathers. He said in John 8 a very shocking statement, the 44th verse. He said, you are of your father the devil and the lust of your father you will do. Now, he says, for many of you, the devil is your spiritual father. Now, you're not aware of it. You wouldn't admit it, but that's the way God looks at it. There's either God, your spiritual father, the true and the living God, Christ, or there is the devil. And then you have to choose not only between two ways of life and two masters and two fathers, but you have to choose between two destinies, heaven or hell. Solomon wrote about the way to hell in Proverbs 7, 27. C.S. Lewis, the great Cambridge and Oxford professor, he taught at both universities, used to emphasize, he said, no one ever had so much to say about the way to hell as did Jesus Christ. On the other hand, no one ever spoke of heaven with more clarity and authority as Jesus Christ. And one of the most played pop songs is the Led Zeppelin Stairway to Heaven. Jesus Christ is the stairway to heaven. He is the way to heaven. Come to him. And if you want to come to him, pick up that telephone if you're watching. 
and call that counselor who's waiting to talk to you about the way to heaven and how you can find Christ. He said, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. Yes, Jesus is in heaven preparing your estate right now, waiting for you. There is a future life. And eternal life does not begin when you die and go to heaven. It begins here and now when you make this choice for Christ. Because eternity, eternal life comes to dwell in your heart tonight. Jesus Christ is the gateway to heaven. Now this choice also you must make yourself. Joshua said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Your father can't make it for you. Your mother can't make it for you. Your children can't make it for you. This is where you must choose yourself. He knew that he could not choose for the tribes of Israel. They must choose for themselves. Man is a social being. However, there's an inner sanctuary within ourselves where we retire from all other fellowships, comradeships, and influences, and there's a lonely arena where the greatest battles of life must be fought alone. And this is a decision that you have to make alone. Moses said, I call heaven and earth to record this day that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that thou and thy seed may live forever. Notice it says thy seed. This has something to do with your children and your grandchildren and your children's children. My son and I were talking tonight about how it passes on from generation to generation, this faith that we have in Christ. The writer to Hebrews recounts how Moses, esteeming the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, choosing rather to suffer the affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. He made a choice. Moses could have probably been the Pharaoh of Egypt. He was the son of Pharaoh's daughter, heir to all the riches and power of Egypt. And he made a choice to suffer persecution and the reproach with the people of God. He didn't know that his name would be in history. He didn't know that someday he would lead all of Israel. He didn't know that someday he would be considered one of the greatest men that ever lived. When he made that choice, he made it on the basis of simple faith in God. Some think that Guy Laffler is the world's greatest hockey player. And he said a month ago that each of us has only one past, but there are many futures. You see, you can't change your past, but you can determine your destiny by deciding for Christ. And when you do that, Christ changes your past. He wipes out all the sins of the past. Because you see, the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses it from all sin. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. When He died on that cross, He forgave all the past. You tonight are reminded of the many sins in your life. The Holy Spirit's bring them to your mind right now. And you know they stand against you at the judgment where every secret thing will be brought out. But Jesus tonight offers forgiveness. But he offers more than forgiveness. He offers justification, just as though you had never committed a sin. What a wonderful thing to go to bed tonight and know that the past is gone, forgiven, cleansed, and God no longer remembers your sins. Yes? And this choice is very urgent. To delay makes the right decision harder. Indecision is itself a choice. Not to decide is to decide not to. Choose now. Nowhere in the Bible does it promise a tomorrow. Come while you can. Time itself makes the decision for you if you don't. You say, but what do I have to do? Three things. You must be willing to repent of your sin. That means to change your way of thinking about your sins and realize how bad they are in the sight of God. Change your way you're thinking about God and say, I love Him and I'm going to love Him with all my heart, mind, and soul. 
I'm going to make him the priority of my life. I'm going to put him first from now on. He's going to be not only my Savior, but my Lord. You may be a member of the church. You may not be a member of any church. You may be an officer in the church, but you're not sure about your relationship with Christ and you want to be sure. And you must be willing to repent. And secondly, by faith, receive Christ into your heart. That means you put your whole weight on him and trust him and him alone. And thirdly, you follow and serve him as his disciple and follower and obey him. That means a big change for many of you if you make this choice. I'm going to ask you to make it now. And I'm going to ask you to do it publicly as we've seen thousands of people this week already come to Christ. I'm going to ask you to get up from your seat. If you start from that top stand up there, it'll take you two minutes. So start now. And come and stand in front of this platform. And as you all stand here in front of the platform, I'm going to say a word to you and have a prayer with you and give you some literature and you can go back and join your friends. You're making that choice by coming and standing here. And the reason I do it publicly is because every person that Jesus called, he called publicly. Joshua called upon the people publicly. Moses called upon the people publicly to inscribe their commitment that would be seen publicly for generations to come. I'm asking you tonight to publicly and openly come and say tonight, Christ is going to be priority in my life. I want to know that I have eternal life. And you that have been watching by television, pick up the telephone and call that number. There are people standing by to talk to you right now. As hundreds are responding to Mr. Graham's invitation to make a public commitment to Jesus Christ, you can make that same commitment right where you are. Just pick up the phone and call the number you see on your screen. Special friends are waiting to talk with you and pray with you about this most important decision.